Lord Jesus, for your grace and your mercy upon us, Lord. Wonderful spirit, oh God, that we feel. Courage, Lord. Wonderful. Worship you, Lord. We worship you, God. Thank you, Lord. Praise God. You may be seated. The Lord bless you. Hallelujah. I just enjoy hearing the sing for a lot longer than we have. Praise God. Yeah. South America, there's something about it. Uh, they, they love to sing, so we're used to long, song services an hour long. Uh, sometimes uh, they, you know, they can, they just let, they love to sing, and a lot of it is, uh, takes them so long, some of them, to get to church, that once they're there, they're, they're there for the duration, and it can be a long time. We are blessed to be here tonight, and to feel the Spirit of the Lord. Uh, Sunday night, praise God for the opportunity to be here with you in St. Petersburg, Florida. Beautiful area that you live in. And, uh, you know, I I know that a lot of people who live in beautiful areas, after a while, they don't see that beauty. But I, I trust that you still see the beauty of the area that you live in. We have been blessed uh, to live in some beautiful areas when we were younger. But the uh, city that we lived in, we love Buenos Aires. We love Argentina, but uh, very, very flat and uh, not a lot of variation in the terrain for a long ways uh, from the city. And so it's just it, we've been blessed in the last several months to be traveling in different areas of the United States and now to be here and, and see some of the beauty that is here. We thank God that he has been with his people and is with his people. I don't believe at all that the Lord has uh, gone away from us or that this is a, an air, a time in history where God is less with us than he was with other people. I believe the Lord is as much with his people today as he's always been. Hallelujah. And I feel his spirit, feel his presence. I believe that when we do anything can happen in the presence of the Lord. I appreciate the opportunity to represent a continent to you tonight, the continent of South America, and we'll just talk just a little bit about that and bring something from the Word tonight. Uh, we have lived uh, most of our life overseas. Uh, we went there when we were young people, as 23 years old, when we went to Buenos Aires, Argentina, and now, well, we left there at 52, and in the last 10 years, been over all of South America. So, uh, almost 40 years now we've been involved in missions and I look at some of these flags here represent a few of the countries that uh, we have uh, worked in uh, and now are working in uh, some of the northern countries of South America very much different than the southern part but uh, we do praise God that there is one thing that unifies God's work worldwide the Bible says by one spirit are we all baptized into one body. So I praise God for the one spirit, the power of the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. Uh, we do speak Spanish, um, have to speak Spanish after being there that long. It would be a shame to not speak Spanish after living there 29 years. Uh, all of our children were born, uh, two of our children were born there. All of them were very young. The old, our oldest daughter was six weeks old. Our son was eight months old. Uh, after being born on deputation, and the last two were born there. If you ask them today where they're from, uh, they say, we are from Argentina. And we've had people say, well, they, you know, for one lady told my wife, she said, you know, for being Argentine, they sure do look like you folks. And I thought, well, yeah, uh, you know, <laughs> it doesn't really matter where they were born. <laughs> but we do thank God that uh, he has allowed our family to experience some great things uh, in the spirit. Uh, we've had a lot of different experiences, most of them very good. Uh, there are a few uh, bumps and lumps along the way, but uh, the Lord has certainly showed us that he is with his people, that his power works the same everywhere. When there's a hungry heart and a hungry soul that wants to serve God, the power of God is there to not only fill them, but to empower them to serve the Lord. I thank the Lord that it is possible to serve God in the worst of circumstances and in the best of circumstances. Hallelujah. We, uh, through the years, have seen a development in the work of Argentina as well as, as the whole continent. Uh, we feel like there is a growing desire for revival, even though it's always been there. There's a growing desire for revival. It seems like every country is, 
excited about what God is going to do. And we know that he already is doing great things. We have seen, um, my wife may tell you, about a conference right now that's going on in Argentina. But uh, some time back, the country of Paraguay, uh, this is a small country. It's a, a difficult country, really. Uh, the people are really, don't go to almost, most of them don't go to any church. And uh, so consequently, uh, our missionaries have had to dig it out there. But I thank God that we're seeing uh, really a breakthrough. Uh, there, there used to be for two or three to get the Holy Ghost, five people to get the Holy Ghost. It was a major triumph. They just had a three-day conference where 98 people received the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. That's exciting. Praise God. Hallelujah. I mean, this is a... This is um, it's not a it is somewhat of a backward country, but a, a very, very proud people that it's difficult for them, some of them to uh, humble themselves and realize that they need the Lord just as much as anybody in the world needs God. But I praise God that we're seeing revival in places like that. We've also been a part of of uh, revival meetings where we've seen hundreds of people filled with the Holy Ghost. So we have been blessed to be in some of those. To be in a conference in Venezuela and Colombia is an experience all by itself. Uh, Colombia, there's just uh, an overwhelming desire to worship God. In Venezuela, they come to church uh, for a conference. They'll be there an hour early, and they will sit, they will stand in the altar. Uh, first time I saw them do that, I, I asked the brother, I said, what, what are these people doing? He said, well, they're getting ready for church. I said, well churches until an hour from now and they're standing here in the altar he says well they want to make sure they get their place and uh, after the church started i realized why the altar was full of people and some of those uh, one particular place in barquis cement was probably a thousand people maybe in the altar and it's just full right right from the platform clear to the to the front pew i said you can't call anybody to the altar in uh, in that kind of situation because they just fill up the aisles they never really get to the altar and we'll have a three-hour service easy and they'll jump and shout and praise god for another 45 minutes or so and uh, some of those have kids in their arms you know holding these kids in their arms i thought how in the world do they do that i couldn't even stand there that long and and then they are so hungry for the lord that they have a little walkway on the from the platform kind of out a little ways you, you walk out there they'll reach out there with their hankies and try to shine your shoes for you as you're preaching you know and reach out there to touch your legs so they touch the man of god and you think Lord, have mercy. It's no wonder that God fills these people over and over because the Bible says they that hunger and thirst after righteousness shall be filled. Hallelujah. I praise God we have some promises of the Lord in our lives that we can count on. I want my wife to come and say something real quick. Uh, we do speak Spanish. and Alguien aquí habla español? Ah, bueno, hay algunos. Gracias a Dios. ¿De dónde son? ¿Son de acá o de algún otro país? <laughs> bueno, me alegre, hermanos, y uh, we won't translate it here tonight, but uh, it's just been a part of our lives. Uh, me gustaría mucho predicar en español fuera de predicar en inglés. Soy más ungido en castellano, soy más bendecido. Todas mis notas están en castellano. La palabra de Dios para mí es lo que es lo que quiero leer primero en castellano, después en inglés, a ver si hay algo. Pero doy gracias a Dios, hermano, por el poder de Dios que hay en su iglesia. Y yo quiero decir que la Biblia dice que id por todo el mundo, predicad el evangelio a toda criatura. Ay, me alegra que hay un solo evangelio. La Biblia dice hay un Señor, una fe, un bautismo, un Dios y Padre sobre todo, por todo y en todo. Aleluya. I know y'all got the last part, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father, above all, through all, and in you all. I praise God that this is a wonderful, singular, uncomplicated gospel that we have in our hands tonight. It is the gospel of Jesus Christ. Let's give the Lord a hand praise. Hallelujah. I thank you, God, for the gospel that you have given unto us, Lord. And allow us, Jesus, to preach this word. We praise you. Thank you. Hallelujah. Praise God. It's so good to be here tonight and feel his presence. 
in synthesis, he said he would rather preach in Spanish than English. He's more anointed in Spanish than he is in English. I might say the same, too. He is more anointed in Spanish than English because that's the language that we're used to. Um, if you look at his notes, if you look at my notes, I'm, not, I'm more restricted than he is. But his notes are all in Spanish, and he'll preach to you in English. So Spanish has been our life. This morning when we were over in Brandon, uh, Brother Wilkerson said that we had been missionaries for 40 years. And I just looked at my husband and said, no, we're not that old. <laughs> but you know what? God has been good to us. And I started out before he did. I was a missionary kid in Uruguay two years there and then 40 years now in missions and so it has been my life I can't imagine being or doing anything else than what God has placed in my life to do it was the will of God for my life it was the will of God and is the will of God for my life to be right where I am at and there's no happier place when you're in the will of God it doesn't matter what comes at you. It does not matter what circumstances you face. You can go through any storm, any trial, if you are in the will of God. It's, it's what matters, being in His will. We were taught, singing about the name tonight. You know, that is an old song. I told Sister Hudspeth that is a throwback, way back to the 70s way back to the 70s and for some of you you did not even exist back then but you know I was thinking about that and we can sing it like we did tonight Jesus Jesus there's just something about that name and it brings a peace and a comfort but I have been in circumstances and you have been in circumstances when you have had to say Jesus and there is something else there there is a power there that you know that instantly God is going to respond to your call and I am so glad tonight that we know a God that we can call upon and he is there for us we have seen great things in South America when we went to Argentina there were about 500 people in all of Argentina that were in the church Today we are so thankful, and it's not due to us, but we were there in the very beginning when the foundations were being built. We can thank God today for 30,000 people that know the Lord. And it has been our great privilege. It has been our great privilege to work hand in hand and shoulder to shoulder with men of God. And to know that we're working together for one common cause, and that's the kingdom of God and for souls. My Brother Crosley said that I might mention something that's going on right now in Argentina, and this is what it's all about. Tonight, probably right now, they may be ending up a crusade that is going in on in Argentina tonight. We are believing for many to receive the Holy Ghost up to this point in the last few days. Over 40 have received the Holy Ghost. There have been over 200 healings. Brother Kleindens is there. Brother Elias Limonis, our son, is translating, probably very worn out, because he's translated five times and preached twice. So that's a pretty full schedule from Thursday night till Sunday. So he will come back to the States very tired. But what is exciting to me is that this message, this truth, was not just for my parents or just for myself but it's for the generations to come and what is exciting about this conference to me that is going right now on right now is that it is a dream of the young ministers of the country of Argentina Paraguay Chile is that it that's the three countries that are involved ministry ministers in their mid 30s that decided we cannot forget our DNA. We cannot forget the apostolic DNA. And so they decided that they were going to have a conference every year, this is the fourth year I believe, where just doctrine is preached. 
just the word is preached. Oneness, Holy Ghost infilling, holiness, everything that has to do with truth. And to me, that is a great indicator that this message will never fail. We have it, we have entregar it, we have given it in to trustworthy hands. And this message will be carried on. It is so great to know that we serve a God that knows all things and his word will stand through all generations. It's very important that my kids and my grandkids know this message, that they preach this message, because if I don't give it to them, my testimony fails. I depend on them. My life, my testimony depends on the next generation just as they depend on us to give it to them. And so it is a wonderful thing to see it in Argentina and through all South America. Of course, we're more familiar with Argentina, so we talk about it a lot. When you live there almost 30 years, that's what you're going to talk about. But there is something exciting going on in every country in South America. And, uh, you know, we were traveling over to Motley and listening to a, a do, well, it wasn't a documentary, it was just, uh, we were listening to something on the internet that said that people in the United States do not want to have children now. Their interests are el elsewhere, and unfortunately, if you go to a lot of our churches, they're dying because there is not a generation coming up. Because people are selfish. They're looking at their own interests and their own pleasure but in South America and most countries throughout the world it is not so in Argentina itself and probably throughout all of South America 75% of the population is under the age of 25 do you think we have a job to do we have a great job to do and I am so proud. Years ago, there was no Sunday school department in, in Argentina. So, you know, you got to do what you got to do. So I started one. And um, for two years, I organized camp meetings and retreats and different things for kids. And then I said, you know what? Now it's yours because someday I may be gone and somebody else is going to have to do it. So here it is. You're, I will watch from the sidelines. I will give advice and counsel and kind of direct you, but it's yours. I'm putting it in your hands. And I have to say, they went far beyond what I ever would have done or could have done in the children's ministry. And so we have fantastic things happening with kids in South America. Just a few months ago, we had 400 receive the Holy Ghost in a children's crusade in Manaus, Brazil. It is not unusual when we have a children's camp for 200 to receive the Holy Ghost. We have kids that go out on the streets. They walk down the streets. They have even had police escorts to protect them from getting hit by cars or whatever. And they will go down the streets, evangelize with clowns and whatever is available to them to reach out and make it attractive to children. They'll get to a plaza, and there they will have a service. Sunday mornings, during the week, whenever, because we don't have the convenience that Americans have. We don't have Sunday school classrooms. We have one room. That's the church. That's where you're sitting right now, but there are no classrooms. So we have Sunday school on Saturday. We have Sunday school on Wednesday, wherever we can to reach these children. We don't have very many kids in here tonight, so I will mention this. The great need became so real to me one day when I went into, when you get married in any South American country, you get married by the civil authorities, and then you have a church wedding afterwards. And so we went to a civil ceremony before the justice of the peace, the judge, to be witnesses for a wedding of a couple in one of our churches and we were there waiting for them to have their turn to go before the judge to be married and we were sitting there waiting and I glanced over because it's the registry 
a person, so you get married there. Uh, when you have a child, you get you register your child there. If you're changing addresses, you register and change it all there. And I'm sitting there, and all of this business activity is going on. And I glance over, and there's a sign on the wall, not just handwritten, not just handwritten or even printed out on a copier. It is an official sign that says every mother under the age of 12 who comes to register her baby must be accompanied by her mother. So we have mothers that are under 12 years old giving birth. Do you think we have a need to reach these children? We have a tremendous need, and that's what they are there for. And we are glad that God is honoring all that everybody is doing to reach children, to reach adults, to reach the elderly, because our time is short. Our time is short. The sky is darkening. We sang that song tonight. He's coming, riding on a cloud. And sometimes we have a tendency to think it's still a long ways away. But I don't believe so. I believe by what we see happening around us, even in this country, our time is short. And we have to get this message out before he comes. May God bless you. We want to thank you for your giving to missions. Uh, your pastor mentioned this is a, uh, is this your mission Sunday for today? And uh, your faith promise commitment. I thank God and pray that God will not only supply your needs and your commitment, but go far beyond that. Uh, I, I have known, and I'm sure you as well, and through the years, that God doesn't just go with the minimums. That we have a God who, he goes with, he exceeds. You know, the Bible uses that word, exceeding abundantly, more. Praise God. I like that idea, you know. And uh, sometimes I wish it was that way in the natural world, you know, that uh, when we had money, it would be exceeding abundantly more. I like that. But uh, the truth is, in the Holy Ghost, it always is that way. Sometimes we come and, and there's just not a whole lot of oomph in us, but God is always exceeding abundantly more. Hallelujah. And I praise God today for your giving, your desire. I pray that that desire will continue to grow in every one of us. I, I know that as, a, as, as we get older, as things happen around us, as our families change, our priorities change as well. And yet I do believe that God front and center has to be the priority in our lives. And I believe that he can make a way when we think there is no way. Praise God. And I do believe that every little bit or great bit that you do, God takes it and puts it all together. Uh, I know that there are accountants in our world that uh, they, they miss a zero here and there. They miss a few uh, dollars, a few pennies here and there. But I thank the Lord. He does not in any way. He knows every sacrifice you make. He doesn't just let that die. Uh, people may not know. Uh, your family may not know. But God knows. Hallelujah. And since he's the one that rewards, uh, he's all, the only one that matters. Praise God. So whatever you do, do it as unto the Lord. And I pray that God will recompense you far beyond what you have desired and what you have committed unto him. I do I thank God that he has allowed us to be a part of that, not just in the, in the receiving part. We do receive as missionaries. Uh, even though I'm regional director over all of South America, we operate on partners in missions just like uh, the Dibbles and others that I saw on your wall back there. And uh, I thank uh, you for supporting missions because of churches like this one to support missions, we have been able to minister through the years. Most of the countries around the world, yeah, none of our missionaries, or very few of them, would be able to work there. You have to get a work visa. They're not going to give a work visa to an American that uh, one of their own people, one of their own country can fulfill. So in most cases, uh, we totally depend on the giving of our churches. Somebody said one time, well, aren't you ashamed of, uh, of uh, depending on others? Well, in one sense, uh, 
you know, we would like to, to do whatever we can, and we do. But the truth is, there's no other way other than this way. And I praise God for the response of God's people in our churches to the Partners and Missions Program, to the Faith Promise Commitments. It makes the difference. You know, the 19th century, the 1800s, was the century of Great Britain. And they were the ones that sent the missionaries out to India, William Carey, and others. But the last century has been the century of the North American church, of the United States church. Almost single-handedly, the United States has sent out thousands of missionaries, tens of thousands, if you counted them up, over the hundred years of, of last century. I thank God that our church had a part in that. I praise God that we have missionaries in countries. It's not just people of other faiths and other uh, ideas. I thank God the true gospel of Jesus Christ is being preached in these countries. And it's due to folks just like you that are doing your part for the kingdom of God. I do want to encourage you. You know, I don't believe that missions is just for North America. I don't believe missions is just for the United States. As a, as a result, some of our countries are now sending out missionaries by their own giving. I praise God for that. The country of Brazil, uh, they speak Portuguese. They said, we want to help in every Portuguese-speaking nation in the world. We want Brazil to be involved there. We thank God for the United Pentecostal Church in North America, but we want to be involved in it. Consequently, we have uh, two families tonight in Portugal that are from our Brazilian church being supported by them. We have two families in Africa, Mozambique, Africa, from Brazil. We have sent a, a delegation to Angola, Africa. We've sent a delegation to a little island that I'm forgetting the name of it right now in the South Pacific off of the uh, coast of Australia. And there have been Brazilians involved in missions as well. I thank God for that. I believe that's the way it ought to be. And because of that, we are seeing now we have a Venezuelan missionary that has gone to Paraguay. So within our continent, from one country going into another country, a needy field. So I believe that's uh, part of the future of missions. If the Lord tarries, uh, God knows that we've had some difficult circumstances economically in the States in the past few years. I, I, you know, it's amazing to us in global missions that the income and the giving of our people has not gone down. Even though we know the salaries have gone down, people have lost jobs, people have gotten jobs that pay much less than they used to, and yet I praise God that last year we actually had an increase in global missions giving, hallelujah, from our churches. Praise God. That is a miracle, folks. That's, that's not happening in other groups. Hallelujah. It is not happening in other church groups, and I praise God that, that all together, we are doing what the Lord has called us to do. Uh, there's many, many things I could say, and I won't take, but maybe uh, just a couple of minutes here and let you know uh, the diversity and the, the great uh, variety of peoples that we deal with in South America as well as our country. Somebody asked me one time, why isn't there not a United States of South America? Why doesn't all of South America just get together and make one nation? Well, Folks, in the first first place, it's a huge continent. Uh, not as big as Africa, and certainly not as big as Asia, but uh, Brazil alone is larger than the continental United States, including Alaska. So uh, you can fly for four or five hours inside of Brazil from one city to another. Brazil has the largest city in the world. Uh, Sao Paulo, Brazil, has over 30 million people in it and growing every day. Uh, you can travel, I have, with Brother Weber. When we were there together, we traveled eight hours in that city and never ran out of city. Uh, it's just, uh, you can't say, where's the center of the city? Normally, we kind of mark the center of our cities here in North America with the high-rise uh, places. But uh, in, in Sao Paulo, there are high-rises everywhere. Uh, it's just everywhere. Uh, the city of Buenos Aires we lived in is 13 million people. Uh, it took us an hour and a half to go to some of our churches in the city from our house. And, uh, it, you know, the funny thing about South America, they fall in love with something and they just go overboard. So uh, they 
somebody had the idea of speed bumps and they liked that idea and so they just absolutely went overboard uh <laughs> i mean i've seen three speed bumps in one block uh, on a residential uh street you know they just get out there and someone make their own speed bumps you know they, they have people come and put asphalt down at night put in there uh i've seen we have speed bumps in argentina uh, white enough in some of them now this is an it's not an exaggeration, but there's not a whole lot of these. But some of them are so wide, you can put all four wheels of a van on the speed bump. Uh, you know, you're, you're just up there, you know. And uh, so you don't go very fast over some of those. But from our house to one of our churches, we counted them every night. 37 man-made speed bumps, and probably that many, again, that were just rotten holes in the, in the road. And so uh, driving in some of our cities is a, is a major achievement. Uh, if you've driven overseas, you recognize there aren't many laws that people pay attention to. Uh, there's a lot of signs, but signs are suggestions if the things are good, you know. If you're behind time, don't worry about speed limit, you know. Uh, if it says stop, don't worry about it, you know. Somebody put that up in the wrong place, that's not where it should have been. And so, you know, just uh, a lot of things I have. There's not, a, there's not a scripture that says it, but there is a saying that says, when in Rome, do as the Romans. Um, I've had a lot of people pray through in my car from the airport to our house as I was driving them home. Uh, I've moderated a little bit through the years, but I, I am 63, you know, so I should moderate, I guess, at some point. But we've, we've gone up the wrong way uh, on the freeway, up the wrong exit ramp because traffic was backed up. You say, well, Brother Crosley, how could you do that? Well, there was 150 other cars that doing the same thing. Uh, we've, you know, <laughs> if uh, something's blocked, you know, shoulders are good to drive on. There's not a lot of traffic on them. So there's just a lot of things overseas that are different than they are here. Uh, it, it is, um, you know, truthfully, I have not seen that many bad accidents. I, uh, when there is a bad one cars are unrecognizable but uh really uh, they're very very much precaution you know they're, they're looking around they're, they don't assume that people are going to stay in their lane which they don't uh, we have one uh, in the city of buenos aires there's one street that's 10 lanes wide one way going downtown and um i've seen it absolutely jam-packed and i counted one time at the stoplight i counted the cars there were uh let me see this 10 lanes there was uh 16 of us across the 10 lanes so six cars didn't have a lane they just got in between the other cars that were there and uh most of most of at least in argentina now it's not as bad in some of others of the country but in argentina they all think they're formula one race car drivers <laughs> some of the cars they have are held together with bailing wire uh i've i've seen a cars without doors i've seen cars uh that you they would not be street legal in any country in the world. But uh, drive, they get in that thing, it's almost like they strap in a helmet and put a roll bar on their car. You know, they are ready to go. So uh, it's very interesting to drive and, and live there. My kids uh, never drove in Argentina, and uh, they never would have wanted to drive there either. My wife did, though. Man, she does great and uh, drive like they do. Well, I would just like to say that, uh, that we have been blessed in, in the protection of the Lord. Through the years, the continent of South America, every major city, every country has seen a huge increase in violence, uh, delinquency. Uh, years ago, drugs passed through our countries. Um, even, even Colombia, there was not as much drug consumption as there was drug production. And they produced drugs for the states. And basically all drugs came either to Europe or the states. Now, through the years, as the drugs passed through, people began to consume them. Consequently, now they don't just pass from Bolivia on down through Argentina and out. Now, um, in all of our countries, there is huge drug addiction problems. And that brings on, of course, a lot of other problems as well. Uh, my wife mentioned the children. There's, there are thousands, hundreds of thousands of homeless children uh, on the streets of all of our major cities uh, you'll see sometimes clumps of four and five children on the street corners and they're they're uh, begging for money 
uh, a lot of those are actually they're supervised by um, uh, for one of a word it, it, they, they, yeah it's, it's like a mafia that runs the kids and so those kids they are actually begging for this mafia Don who gets all their money at the end of the day uh, it's it's something that's hard for us to conceive of unless you're in that environment and in that culture and you go into some of the neighborhoods that we go into and you realize there is a huge need for everything under the sun but we believe that if they can come to a knowledge of the truth and the Lord Jesus Christ can come into their homes and into their lives it will that it's not just a work of the Holy Ghost in a personal life but that begins to radiate out into every area of their life and begins to improve uh, the lifestyle that they have and cause uh, just the love of the church, the, the fellowship of the community of the Lord. I, I like the word connect. I think I saw it on your... I believe in that. I believe that the church is not just a group of people. We actually are a force for good and an influence for good in the community and the city that we're a part of. I praise God for that. I thank the Lord it's not just you and me. The power of the Holy Ghost is resident in the church and He consequently works through us to reach uh, people that otherwise would have a very substandard life. I have, we have seen a work of the Spirit along with the violence and delinquency. There has been a growth in the church in every one of our countries. Our largest work is the country of Venezuela. Venezuela is, is a, a very conflicted country. I don't know if you've heard anything about Venezuela. Uh, their president was Hugo Chavez, who was very much a, a leftist, uh, basically communist. And, uh, you know, anybody is going to have problems when Fidel Castro is their idol. And uh, that was true of Hugo Chavez. Uh, he passed away, but uh, the country has been basically uh, left with huge issues. Right now, our people in Venezuela, most of them are kind of prisoners in their own country. They can't, they can't leave their country because they have no money to do so. Their money is not worth anything outside of the country. It's barely worth anything inside the country. The official exchange rate, six believers to one dollar on the street. You can get 30, 40, 50, 60. It just depends uh, on the exchange. But it is illegal to exchange dollars, to buy dollars, to sell dollars, and you have to have dollars to travel. So basically the people are uh, captive in their own country. There's, they lack everything, and this is a, a fairly rich country. They are one of the few OPEC countries, well, the only OPEC country in the Western Hemisphere. And uh, to think that a country that was up here has all of a sudden come down here is very discouraging to a people that's very proud and, and nationalistic of their country, rightly so. But I praise God that in the midst of that, the ups and downs of the economy and the culture has just absolutely been destroyed. And yet I thank God that the church has maintained its integrity and its love for God and the power of God in our church is just continuing to grow. We have in Venezuela about 270,000 believers in that one country. Hallelujah. 1,400 churches, uh, probably 1,200, 1,300 ministers and pastors. Their goal, hallelujah, is to add uh, at least another hundred churches in the next year and a half. I believe that God is with His church in the bad times and the difficult times. He is sovereign, hallelujah. doesn't depend on the economy. It depends on the power of God and the desire of His people. Uh, so many things that we could say, and I don't want to uh, go on forever here, but uh, if you've never been to South America... I would invite you to someday make a trip there. Not just to see the beautiful things. There's a lot of beautiful things there. But to see also the people of God. Just to be in a service with them and see in, in many, many of our countries. They're not all the same. Some of them are more reserved. Peru, Ecuador, uh, Bolivia, uh, reserved at, at least for a while. When they get in the altar, folks, they can go all night long. Uh, some of those people in Peru just wear you out in the altar because they just, they'll, they, I mean, these are people, you know, short uh, people, 
not really robust, some of them, and you think, how can they do that? I mean, they can stand there and clap their hands for an hour. In the, in, I mean, just sweat, just to pour it off of them. And, I'm, you know, my tongue's hanging out about 30 minutes after we started, you know. It has nothing to do with my age, by the way. But uh, I, I just, I'm amazed at, uh, at their desire that is shown in the way they seek after the Lord. So we're blessed, and I could say so many things. I just want to say one thing, just a points of interest. We have the highest, the tallest falls in the world in Venezuela, Angel Falls. We have the highest mountain in all of North and South America, Mount Aconcagua in the Andes Mountains, which happens to be in Argentina, divides from Chile. We have, uh, oh, we have some fantastic places. There's Machu Picchu is uh, a, a, an Inca city up in the clouds. It is up on a mountaintop. They actually took part of that mountaintop off to build this city back in the, what, back in the 1200s, 1300s, 1400s. I mean, this is a, it's an amazing place. Uh, we have uh, one of the largest freshwater lakes that's so high, uh, Lake Titicaca, which is between Peru and and uh, Bolivia has floating islands on it. We actually have a church on one of those floating islands. They just keep building this island. It's made out of rushes and stuff, and they just keep putting brushes on it and keep building it up. Uh, I've never been on it. Brother Monty Showalter has said you walk, and it's kind of spongy you know, as you walk along. <laughs> but I thank God the church is there. We have the most powerful river in the world, the Amazon River, uh, which is just an amazing river, actually, uh, has tributaries. The Black River comes into the Amazon River and makes a mark, just almost a, a straight line down the middle of that river, black on one side and brown on the other, until the brown overcomes it and it, it, it continues on out to the sea. Amazon River is so powerful that it goes 100 miles out into the ocean with fresh water, still fresh water out there. It's so big that when it rises uh, in the, the high uh, rainy season, and it rains, I mean, it can absolutely downpour for an hour or two every day in the Amazon. It's so hot, 110 degrees, it, you sweat while you're taking a shower. It's just, it's really, you, I'm not kidding you either. I'm telling you, folks, it's a horrible place. Amen. <laughs> that river, when it gets up at, at its height, it spreads out 100 miles wide into the Amazon jungle. And, uh, you know, just a few feet deep out there in some areas, but other areas full of piranhas, which are basically fish that are teeth with a tail. Just uh, um, horrible things, folks. They, they can strip a cow in a minute. They can strip that thing down to the bones. Happens to have a, a bleeding on it or some kind of a, an ulcer or whatever. So places I don't want to go. I've been there, but I've not, I don't get out in that water but see little eight-year-old nine-year-old kids out there swimming in that water makes you it makes you wonder the hardiness of these people so we have some great things uh in in south america but above all to us is the the absolute power of god in some of these places we have we have floating churches in the amazon uh, maybe a fourth the side of this sanctuary and built on a raft, a balsa raft, so the ri river rises and falls, the church rises and falls, and, and no, uh, no, no problem. Uh, and they have Pentecostal worship services in this floating church. I don't know. I've never been there when they're jumping and shouting, praising God. I always wanted to be like a waterbed, you know. But uh, all i got to say is it, it doesn't matter where they meet for church, but the the spirit that we preach, the gospel that we preach, is not just confined to the great cities, and it's not uh, designated just for the rural areas. It works in every country the same way. People receive the Holy Ghost the same way, speaking in other tongues as the Holy Ghost give us. Praise God. So we are blessed to be a part of that because of you. Uh, we've been 40 years now, almost 40 years involved in this and we we plan on continuing on at least for several more years praise god uh the lord has given us good health through the years i've i was kidnapped for a few hours in buenos aires uh, uh difficult time uh they thank god they released me i mean they, they took my shirt but left me with my pants i was thankful for that 
Amen. <laughs> Brother Burgess, when he saw me, I just had my T-shirt on. He said, oh, God, did they take his pants? And, no, they didn't. Thank God. But uh, took, took my computer, took $1,200, took my van, took a lot of things, and beat me on the head with their guns. And uh, these two guys, you know, they're all hopped up on drugs. And then they took me to this place surrounded by about, oh, I'd say eight of them maybe, eight or nine of them, all of them with guns. God wanted to prove he had he wanted to prove to me that he had a bullet in his gun, so he fired his gun off, you know. And then he just uh, fired another one and almost almost plugged one of his buddies in the, in the foot. And so they're about ready to get in a gunfight right there. Uh, and, you know, I, you, you wonder, why did that happen? And I don't have the answer as to why that happened. I don't, you know, I don't think God... Uh, made them do that. I don't think it, it was necessarily the will of God for them to do that. But I do believe this, that God is with us in any situation. God was with me there. Hallelujah. Now you say, well, why, if he was with you, why didn't he preserve, Why didn't he keep you from being kidnapped? I don't know. I don't know. Can't answer that. All I can answer is, I know he was with me. I mean, it, I, I ended up with about seven or eight eggs on my head from them beating me guns and um i never i never saw stars uh, my head didn't start going round and round i i it didn't even hurt i can tell you the truthfully i never had one pain from that either when they were hitting me or after they were done the police couldn't believe it, it took me to the hospital to have me x-ray because i was a north american if i'd not been a north american they said well you're lucky you're alive and you know i i and yet you know i i knew that God was with me at that point. Now, I was not a brave person, and I wasn't, I, I had the Holy Ghost, but I didn't really feel full of the Holy Ghost at that moment, you know. I was not just talking in tongues right there, you know. I was, I was certainly afraid, certainly concerned, and yet God has a way. He sent him, you know, they took my credit card, they, they thought they had hit the lottery, the gold American Express card, the guy was jumping around with my card in his hand, you know. He said, la tarjeta de oro, la tarjeta de oro. And I, I said, I hate to disappoint you guys, but I don't think they work here. That really brought them down. And they, you know, God knows. God knows. Sent a guy along that I, you know, I had told him, sent a guy along. I believe God sent that. That they trusted in. And he worked in that type of thing. Credit card, fraud, and all kind of stuff. And uh, they said, tell your story to him. Don't look at him. Don't look at him. Just Tell him your story. So I, I told him, I said, I don't think these will work here. I don't have pin numbers. They want pin numbers. I don't have pin numbers. They're going to kill me for nothing because I don't have the numbers. They don't. I've never used them in ATMs in my life. And, it, you know, he looked at him, looked over me. He said, you know what? I think it's just like he said. They won't work here. And so they gave me back my credit cards. Can you believe that? So they even gave me taxi fare, you know. Of course, at 3 in the morning, I'm walking down in these bad areas <laughs> you know, I mean, you can get out of one gang's hands and fall into another gang's hands. So the Lord was with me. Praise God. I can truthfully say the Lord is with his people in every circumstance and in every time. Hallelujah. So I just thank God for the power of his spirit. I'd like to bring just a short word from the Lord here tonight. And don't want to take maybe, what time do you know? 7, 20. So we'll take about 10 minutes here and bring a short word. If, if you would... Uh, like to read with me in Genesis chapter 28 there's a verse of scripture that speaks to my heart and uh, I believe will to us as well Genesis 28 and verse 16 says and Jacob awaked out of his sleep and he said surely the Lord is in this place and I knew it not and he was afraid and said how dreadful is this place this is none other but the house of God and this is the gate of heaven verse 19 and he called the name of that place Bethel verse 20 and Jacob vowed a vow hallelujah saying if God will be with me and then further on he says I will do this praise God Lord bless you you may be seated in Jesus name I just want to bring a short thought here about the awesome place the awesome place because the word that shows here in our English Bible does not really adequately in our current English uh, understanding, does not adequately describe 
what that place was to Jacob that day. Uh, the word dreadful there, if, if, if I were to use that today, and uh, my wife would say, what do you think of this dress? Uh, it's a new dress I just bought. What do you think? And I say, that's dreadful. Uh, I, I don't think she would be pleased. I don't think she'd bake my favorite, <laughs> my favorite meal that day. Uh, if, uh, if you had a car that you were really proud of, you just waxed it up, you just got it fixed up, you said, what do you think of my car? You say, it's dreadful, absolutely dreadful. What about my house? Dreadful. Uh, you know, after a while, you would not want to be around anybody that thought it was dreadful. And yet the truth is, Dreadful in our current English, and as it, in this verse, is out of place. Because the word dreadful there comes from a, a Hebrew word, J-A-R-E, which actually means standing in awe. In other words, it means awesome. So when he said, how dreadful is this place, in reality he was saying, how awesome is this place, O oh God. I did not know that you were here. I thought it was just a bad place. It's just a place full of rocks. I just stopped at this place. As a matter of fact, uh, before or farther up, it says he came to a certain place and he laid down in that place. And then he gets up and he says, this place. But then he calls it the awesome place. This place is awesome. Now, I would like to propose to us that anywhere, that the Spirit of God is upon us in a special way. It's an awesome place. It's the kind of place that we can say along with Jacob, I, the Lord was in this place and I didn't even know it. Because I looked at the circumstances around me. I looked at the fact that I had nobody with me. Nobody loves me. Nobody cares about me. That's the, the state that Jacob was in. And we can all from time to time get to feeling that way and, and kind of get a little bit depressed. And the place he was was a depressing place until he saw this vision of the Lord, of angels going up and down on this stairway. The Lord is up above promising him some promises. And Jacob wakes up and says, Man, the Lord is in this place and I didn't even know it. He said, how awesome is this place. Hallelujah. I feel that way about the Holy Ghost. I feel that way about this service here tonight. It's, it's an awesome place when we begin to worship God and honor Him and reach out to Him. It's, it's like the angels start going up and down the stairway. Hallelujah. I've never seen that I know of an angel unless that guy that, that day bought the credit cards was an angel. I don't know. All I can say is, whether I've seen it or not, I've felt the presence of the mighty God in my life in such a way that all I could say is just like Jacob. I didn't even know that the Lord was going to touch me today. I didn't even know that the power of God was like that today. Just thought it was going to be a normal day. And yet how awesome is this place where I am right now because the power of God is here. Hallelujah. Now I believe the world needs to hear that and feel that, but I think we need to recognize that the Lord is an awesome God. You know, there are some words that uh, in English, as far as I'm concerned, they are words that only belong to God. They only belong to divine things. Glory is one of them. Holiness is another. Awesome is another. There are some things that they don't have any relationship really to human ideas and to human energy. You know, we have may have a lot of energy, may have a lot of power, but there's nothing that can compare to the holiness of our God or the awesomeness of our God. You know, when we talk about the glory, man didn't really have glory. It's, it's really not a word for man. We may have honor. We may have courage. We may have valor, but we, no, it's not glory. There is no really no glory of man. Hallelujah. It all belongs to God. Hallelujah. So when the Bible says all glory belongs unto him, I think it's not just the fact of glory. Even the word glory belongs to our Lord. Hallelujah. And I praise him because he allows us to feel it and to, and to participate in it. You think about it. If I was God and if you were God, we would be more selfish than the God that we serve is. I wouldn't share some things with the, 
lowly human beings? And yet he does. You know, he does, he did say, I, my glory I will not share with another. But I think in that aspect he was talking about, he would not let anyone else be God. He was God alone, and that glory of Godship belonged to him alone. And yet he does share with us in the church. The glory of God comes down upon us. Hallelujah. We feel the glory of God in our services. When we, when we get together and worship God or pray on the altar or sing a good song, the glory of the Lord is right there in the midst of us. As a matter of fact, the apostle said, we saw his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Hallelujah. The awesome place. The awesome place. I pray that I, I, I don't believe that we can truly be, be who God wants us to be until we have experienced what Jacob experienced there. God has to become more than just a story to us. He has to be more than just someone who meets a certain need that we have. Uh, to, to some people, he's only their healer. To other people, he's only their provider. Uh, but th God, even though he does those things, that's not who he wants to be principally in our life. He wants to be the God of the awesome place. He wants to be the God that fills us. Hallelujah. Circumstances are bad, and they were still bad. When Jacob woke up, he wasn't any richer than he was before he went to sleep. He didn't have any more people around him that loved him than he did when he went to sleep. What made that place awesome was not what he received in natural things or material things. What made that place awesome is the voice of God that spoke promises unto him and touched him in such a way that when he woke up, it was a different place. Hallelujah. He said, everything's different. Praise God. The Lord is with me. As a matter of fact, my own desires have changed, he said. Hallelujah. Aren't you thankful that the Lord changes our lives and changes our minds and the way we think and the way we do? You know, matter of fact, Jacob was one of the most selfish people that you could find in the Bible. This guy, you wouldn't want to buy a used car from Jacob. I can tell you that right now. This is a guy that he put sawdust in the differential for a while. Amen. Well, this is a good car. Oh, yeah, a little grandma had it in her garage for 10 years and took it out for a spin once a year. What he didn't tell you is that it's not the grandma that drove it. It's the grandson that was 16 years old that peeled out for the block every time and had no regard at all for the car. But Jacob wouldn't tell you that. Jacob's the kind of guy you don't want in church. Amen. And yet the Lord wanted Jacob. The Lord desired Jacob. That encourages me tonight. Hallelujah. God allowed the awesome place to be with the guy that didn't deserve it. He had no merit. He had There was no consideration as to why Jacob should have felt the power of God there. I thank the Lord that he has this in the Bible because it shows me that even when I'm in a funk and I'm, I'm not in a good mood and it seems like things are not just going my way, it doesn't matter to God. He is there. The Bible says in, in the book of Hosea, it talks about God and Jacob, and it says he found him in Bethel. He found him in Bethel. Now who found who? Did Jacob find God, or did God find Jacob? It really doesn't matter. But if it's God finding Jacob, that means that God went there on purpose, knowing that Jacob was going to come by there. God was already ready to reveal his awesomeness to Jacob. God was there to bless Jacob. God was there to anoint that man. Hallelujah. A man that did not deserve it. A man just like you and me. Hallelujah. Sometimes we come up to the altar. We come before the Lord. And we're just, just so casual. So so just, well, okay, it's a normal day. And everything's gone bad. And everything's rotten. You know what? Everything may be rotten on the human level, but there is another level. Hallelujah. The stairway didn't go horizontally. It went vertically. Hallelujah. And when Jacob looked up that stairway, he's looking at something else. Praise God. I believe with all of my spirit tonight, we have other things other than what seems to be in our lives. Uh, there are a lot of people, for whatever reason, 
they feel like people don't love them. In some cases, they're right. You know, nobody does love them. Maybe they're not lovable people. And, uh, and yet this is encouraging to me because the Lord loves. The, you know, the Bible says further on in the book of Romans says, Jacob, this is God talking. He says, Jacob, have I loved. Who could love a rotten person like Jacob? A liar. I mean, he, his father was blind, and he, he had no problem deceiving his blind father. Now, who, who would defraud your blind father? Jacob. Jacob would. He didn't even care for his mother. He said, Mom, if I do this, I'm going to be cursed by my father. She said, don't worry about it, Jacob. I'll take your curse. Most, most sons would say, oh, no, Mom, you can't do that. Jacob said, that's a good deal, Mom. You go ahead and take my curse. No problem. This is a guy that defrauded his brother, stole from his brother. Not the kind of guy that we would necessarily want to be friends with. But I praise God that that could be true of every one of us. If it were not for the power of the awesome God in our lives and the awesome place. Jacob said, I, can't, I cannot leave this place without calling it something different. It's not Luz. This is, this is Bethel. This is the house of God. Who knew about that? Just Jacob and God. He's talking to himself really there. He's just talking to God. There's nobody else around him, nobody with him. He said, this place, whoo, awesome place. The Lord is here. This place is now called Bethel. He took the rock that he was sleeping on, put it up on edge, and poured some oil out and anointed the rock. I mean, we look at him, think this, this guy's crazy. He's nuts. What's he doing? I'll tell you what he's doing. He's responding to the awesome power of God. It's not just enough for him to receive a touch from God or to receive a blessing from God. He says, I cannot receive this from the Lord and just stay like I am and just, just drink it in and let nothing else happen. No, no, i got to do something. And you know what? Years later, 20 years later, God spoke to him in a dream, said, Jacob, this is a, you know, wakes this guy up out of a sleep. He identifies himself to Jacob. And he says this, Jacob, I am the God of Bethel. Hallelujah. Only him and God knew about Bethel. Only his family that he talked to, he told him a little bit about it. God identified himself to this man by what happened between him and God. I, I really believe the Lord is not just the God of all of us. He's not just the God of the church. He is your personal God. Hallelujah. When you have a real, genuine, awesome place experience with God, it's not your pastor telling you something, and it's not your husband or your wife telling you what happened. It's you know. Hallelujah. And when God wakes you up at night and says, Hey, I am the God of Bethel. Hallelujah. The one that you talked with, the one that you responded to. And you know what God said to him? And I close with this. God said, Jacob, I'm the God of Bethel. I remember what you did. He said, you anointed the rock and you vowed a vow. You know, sometimes we think that we're the only ones that remember. We remember the special times with the Lord. We remember special times in our lives when God was definitely with us. I want, I want you to know that God himself remembers personal interactions between you and me. And the, in, the interesting thing to me is God did not remember, even though he did obviously remember, but it wasn't what stuck in, in the Lord's mind. It wasn't what he did. It was what Jacob did. Sometimes we think we, we don't mean that much to the Lord. We know He loves us, and we, you know, but it's just all His grace and mercy. You know what? God remembers you by what you yourself do in your response to the Lord. Sometimes I don't even remember things that I did. People come up to me and tell me, you did this and you did that. And I, truthfully, I do not remember praying for them. I don't remember them being healed. But they, they say that they remember me doing that in different places. I don't even remember some of the things I did, but God remembers the way you respond to Him. doesn't matter what other people think. What matters is, is what you and God 
alone had in the awesome place. Hallelujah. I believe there is a Bethel for every one of us in our lives. And as a result, it changed that man. Hallelujah. Here's a guy that stole and robbed, and all of a sudden he's wanting to give tithes and offerings to the Lord. What changed the man? The awesomeness of the power of God in that place was enough to change his mind on a lot of things. Would you stand with us tonight? I appreciate your time and your attention here tonight. I feel the presence of the Lord here in a special way. Thank the Lord for our musicians here tonight. They just go ahead and find a chorus, begin to sing. But I, I want to I want to talk to the Lord just a little bit here tonight. I'd like to give every one of us the opportunity that we would talk with the Lord a little bit. Maybe think about the awesome times that we've had with the Lord. And if you haven't had one, seek after that. You know, Jacob's kids were forethought by God, designed by God. Twelve tribes of Israel. Out of one tribe was going to come the Lord Jesus Christ from the tribe of Judah. And yet back when Jacob was in the awesome place, changed his life, those boys hadn't even been born yet. They knew nothing of what Jacob had experienced until he started telling them about it. God came to Jacob six years after that, after they came back to the land. He said, Jacob, I want you to come back up to Bethel. And I want you to bring your kids with you. I want you to bring your family with you. It's not enough that you had a Bethel experience. Your family needs a Bethel experience. Hallelujah. He didn't know at that time that they were going to go down to Egypt and not come back for 430 years. He didn't know that. But God knew that. God knew that those boys needed an experience that was going to carry them through hundreds of years that they would come still with a belief in one God and a knowledge of who that God was. That doesn't just happen by accident. Our kids and our grandkids, those that are in our lives, it's not just going to be by osmosis that they serve the Lord. They need a Bethel experience. They need somebody that's going to tell them about Bethel and then take them to Bethel. And the Bible says when they got to Bethel, it says the Lord appeared again unto Jacob at Bethel. God changed his name. He said, Jacob, I'm going to reiterate a promise that I told you. It's not happened yet, but I'm, I'm going to make it happen. He says, your name's going to be changed. You're not going to be Jacob anymore. You're not going to be liar, supplanter defrauder. Now you're going to be named Israel. And your kids are not just going to be the children of Jacob. Your kids are become the children of Israel. I thank God for the power that is in just one encounter with the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, we can name His name a lot of times. But when we have that encounter with Him in that awesome place, and that power of God, it's more than just the power. It's that presence and purpose of God revealed right there. It changes our lives. It can change our kids' lives. It can change our whole family's life. Just by one Bethel experience. I'd like for us to pray just a little bit here tonight. Open this altar up as our singers sing a chorus. Let's seek after the Lord. Say, God, I, I need you to be awesome in my life, God. I need you in my life. You may have you may have the head the Holy Ghost 20, 30 years. I think we need to repeat our Bethel experience from time to time. It's not enough for it to happen one time. I think we need to repeat that. Hallelujah. We need to invite the Lord. God, I want to take, Lord, the rock that I have. I want to pour some oil out of it. I want to vow a vow, Lord. Oh, God, I want to feel your presence and spirit in this place. Hallelujah. Not just a certain place, not just a, a that place, but this is, Lord, an awesome place. 
because your spirit is here with us and your power is here. Could we talk with the Lord just a little bit here tonight? Hallelujah. God bless you, brother. Thank you, Lord, for your spirit tonight. Thank you, God, for the awesomeness of the Holy Ghost, Lord, in the lives of your people.